Welcome everyone to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain, seeking a frank discussion in today's American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Weisberg. Dr. Weisberg is a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Illinois. He's also the author of a number of notable books on politics and pedagogy. Dr. Weisberg is published in leading professional journals and popular outlets, as well as has written articles regularly for The American Thinker and Family Security Matters. He has authored 11 books, the latest of which is entitled Bad Students, Not Bad Schools. Dr. Weisberg, welcome to Inside Academia. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, what uh, is the, essentially the premise of your book? What is a bad student? What makes students bad? Well, a bad student is one who's not very smart, not very motivated. That's the basic definition. Now, bad students also sometimes come with other characteristics. They're violent, disruptive. Um, they cause all kinds of vandalism in the schools, things like that. But the basic argument is that in the United States, if you have very smart kids and they are motivated, they do very well. The rest of the kids, there's not much you can do about them. You can put them in palatial schools, star teachers, bribe the teachers with incentives to boost the test scores, have a national curriculum, on and on and on. This holds for conservative as well as liberal nostrums. You cannot get blood from a turnip. If you have stupid students, you can give them laptops, put them in small classes, have highly motivated teachers. You cannot make them into smart kids. That's it. And every parent knows that. Every teacher in America knows that. Nobody will say it in public, however, because once you admit that, all kinds of consequences flow. Most of them are unspeakable in public. Okay, so let's analyze that premise for a moment. Uh, many people would, would automatically say that um, students uh, at different ages throughout their development, throughout their growth, are going to more or less mature at, at, different, at different rates or at different points in life. Uh, there are many people who were very poor in school and were typically regarded by the teachers as poor students intellectually and academically. I was um, one of them. But I have seen many people that have turned out and shaped up to be pretty sharp cats even if they weren't book smart, uh, and they were typically regarded as quote-unquote stupid or dumb, or let's say intellectually uh, challenged uh, in, in school. But some people turn out to be pretty pretty witty and pretty sharp, and they, they figure out what they need to do in life. Um, so therefore, many would argue that, you know, it's not so much that they're stupid, it's just that they they haven't found themselves, so to Let speak. me go over the... So how do you answer that? It's a very simple answer. Uh, it's brains times motivation. It's multiplied. Now, I think brains are more important than motivation, but motivation is critical. Now, when I was in school, I was not a very well-motivated student. I specialized in the boys' room, smoking Lucky Strike cigarettes and coming my hair into a DA. I was disruptive in school, not by today's standards, but by the standards of when I went to school, I was a wise guy. Um, I didn't pay attention. I didn't do well in, in, in uh, on uh, my exams. I was a very I wasn't a bad student. I was a very middling student. But fortunately, and I suspect this is true for you as well, there comes a moment in life <laughs> when, for some reason, it's like secondary sexual characteristics. It happens that you are more interested in school than you were before, and then you can apply your intelligence. Now, if you are not very smart. And you work very hard, very, very hard. You're not going to become a doctor. But you might become a nurse. Uh, you might even become a nurse practitioner. There are limits on your natural ability. It's, we can all see this in athletics, right? Right. Uh, professional athletic, athletic leagues are filled with basically B-plus players with fantastic work ethics. Mm -hmm. And they do well. And then every once in a while you have somebody with enormous talent who shows up and you know, doesn't do the work. They last a year or so. Everybody says the same thing. What a marvelous talent. Too bad he has a lousy work ethic. He takes drugs. He robs convenience stores. Uh, when you put things in terms of, of athletics, everybody understands that immediately. You cannot take a mediocre basketball player like me. That was my sport in school. And make me into a star. Now, if I work really hard, you know, got to the gym at 6 in the morning and shot 100 foul shots and things like that, I probably would have made my high school team as number 9 on the bench. But right. that's not it. That's about it. So, okay, so basically when it comes down to raw intelligence, I guess mental processing power, 
there's a finite limit that everybody has, right. and you're saying that uh, so many students are just bad. They're not going to have what it takes. Well, everybody knows. What's the average intelligence in the United States? 100. What's the average intelligence you need to do well at a decent school? 120. There are very, very few people above 120 in the United States. So that you're a sole believer in, in IQ as a, as a scientific <coughs> Well, Would absolutely. Okay. No, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. And the experts are doing their best to kill the IQ test. But nevertheless, if you ask a five-year-old, five-year-olds and six-year-olds know all these sorts of things because they haven't been socialized yet. So you go into a first-grade class and you say, Charles, who are the smart kids in the class? They know immediately. Mm -hmm. They don't give you anything about, well, you know, we're all equally talented. We just have different kinds of talents, okay? And I... Do not think that you can actually measure IQ. Uh, they won't tell you that. They'll say, Those, that kid over there, he's really stupid. You know, that guy is impossible. And that kid over there is really smart. Now, we spend another 10 years learning. We're not supposed to say that in public. <laughs> so so you, would, you would disregard any idea that uh, you could, let's say, bring about a sort of a stage of enlightenment in anyone if you encourage them, inspire them, and, and actually get them to find themselves and... And nothing works. They won't, they won't be uh, nothing. able we've, we've poured hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, Head Start started in 1965. It was expressly designed to boost cognitive ability. Okay? It has not. By law, it has to be studied. The results have to be examined every year. Test after test has shown it doesn't work. Now, it may have other wonderful benefits as well. For example, providing jobs. Or old, older people, uh, improving health care, keeping kids off the streets, not a crime. It does not boost cognitive ability. The only time you can boost cognitive ability is when you have somebody who's severely retarded due to circumstances. You know, they had lousy diets, yeah. they were locked in a closet, something like that. And then you can bring it up to what it would have been without the deprivation. That's it. Then what does this mean for schools? What is the purpose of this school insofar as it is an institution? Is it you can to... get an enormous amount out of kids. Enormous amount. I mean, for example, years ago, uh, Catholic schools were very, very effective in this regard. You know, they had the 90-pound nut, Sister Anna Marie Godzilla. Mm -hmm. And she would go into the classroom, okay, and whack their, their little knuckles with rulers. Right, right, right. And she would bring their uh, fathers in as the ultimate doomsday weapon. And she would make him do the Baltimore Catechism over and over and over again, okay? Mm -hmm. You know what? These kids develop good work habits. Now, one of the things I argue in the book is good work habits, like in sports, uh, can compensate for mediocre intelligence. That is, you show up, right. pay attention, do all those wonderful things. So that, discipline. That, in any case, is the problem. I mean, give you an example of that. The Japanese schools spent a lot of time teaching kids to pay attention. It's really simple. Here's how they do it. You sit down, you remain absolutely still, and you stare at a dot on the blackboard. And this is measured with a stopwatch. And you have a little log that tells you how long you've been able to sit still and stare at the dot that day. And you try to improve it. It's like shooting foul shots, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> every day you go out there, and you shoot 100 foul shots, and you keep a record. You know, you're getting better. You know, I used to be able to get 30 out of 100. Now you get 60 out of 100. Mm -hmm. And you get a coach. This, this, the Japanese call this learning to learn. It's very, very important. Now, in the United States, we have a creature that should be killed. It's called Big Bird. Big Bird is, this, is attention deficit disorder on steroids. Sesame Street is not the way you learn Calvinistic virtues. Mm. Sesame Street means you only pay attention when it's exciting and, and, and interesting. Nothing lasts more than about eight seconds. Okay? And everything has to be jazzed up. If you want to go see real learning, go to a school like some of the uh, Orthodox Jewish schools. You will see miserable-looking students sitting there, just like in the old Catholic schools. They're sitting there terrified, okay? But they are learning. Here's the bottom line in all of this. Learning is a natural human uh, instinct. I mean, that's why we're here and have not been asked to leave the gene pool, okay? But going to school 
sitting, paying attention for, in some cases, you know, 50 minutes at a time, going to the bathroom only right. when, et cetera, et cetera, is not a natural phenomenon. Right. That's why we have compulsory education in the United States, okay? Left on their own, most kids would not go to school. You ever hear something called playing hooky? Now, what this means is that it's painful. It's no different to go back to sports than learning a sport. When you first start out learning anything, you know, your first verbs in Spanish are fresh. It's tough. Okay. And after a while, you know, you suffer yourself, but then you get a little bit of a breakthrough. And the next thing you know, you're going into the store ordering things in Spanish or asking questions in Spanish. And you think you're great. Yeah. yeah. And then it's sort of fun. You run around speaking in the language. Same thing as playing golf. Once you get over knowing how to hold the, uh, the club and knowing how to swing the club, it can be fun. But it takes a lot of humiliation to get there. So let me just kind of sum up here. So basically you're saying that the students, so different, there will be natural abilities uh, that vary from mm -hmm. student to student, obviously. And, and we can, I suppose we can accept that. If we can accept that for physical abilities, then um, why can't we suppose the same thing for mental abilities? But the main problem, though, it sounds like bad students are bad students because they're undisciplined and they're unmotivated and they haven't been uh, essentially forced to come to the table and, and seriously learn, like the Japanese student staring at the dot on the wall. So that leads me to the systemic issue. So instead of it being a matter of intrinsics, uh, it becomes a matter of the environment in which you are either not disciplined at all and you're free to goof off and... Uh, you know, to wobble in this uh, in this social world with your friends, with social networking and text messaging, and utterly exactly. not focused on, on exactly. what's going on. So then, the, wouldn't the argument then be that if you took a student and uh, put them in a disciplined environment or any kind of environment that was conducive to learning, such as a good school, uh, where but also where they had some authority over the student, and there are such schools, then wouldn't a even "Quote unquote bad student." If they let's say had both a bad work ethic and mediocre intelligence, you take him out of the bad school and you put him in the good school. Doesn't that student improve? So isn't it therefore also to some degree a role of the environment as opposed to the role? Absolutely. Of the uh, you know what the KIPP schools are? These are uh, charter schools that uh, cater largely to black students. Okay. Okay. They embrace this Calvinist no nonsense. Sit still. You're gonna learn. It's painful, and you better get used to it because it's not gonna change. Okay. Now, they have very good results, but they also have real problems. Okay, hard to keep students in there. Let me go back to athletics. In athletics, it's really simple. Let's suppose you're the coach of the high school basketball team, right? Mm -hmm. And you announce there's tryouts. So 30, 40 kids come, come, come to the tryouts. There's going to be 9, 10 kids on the team. Mm -hmm. What happens to the kids who are goofing off, you know, text messages, messaging. Uh, you can tell they're not paying attention. What happens to those kids? They, the they, they don't, don't make get on the team. team. They, 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 they don't make the cut. Now, you imagine if there was a law that said universal participation in high school basketball is legally required. <laughs> Compulsory <laughs> basketball playing. Right. Sure. In other words, if, if 30 kids uh, uh, showed up, that's your team, okay? So, and moreover, that uh, you have to play all these kids the same. You can tell what is important by how we tolerate cheating. Now, cheating in sports is a serious, serious business. People cheat in sports all the time, but when they get caught, they get huge fines. You follow professional football? Remember about about two years ago, Belichick got caught spying on. Right. Uh, he's the coach of the Patriots, okay? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, they caught him. They caught him spying on something. They find him, I think, half a million dollars personally, mm -hmm. okay? And the team lost a draft choice or something like that. That's serious business, okay? Now, cheating is endemic in education. They catch people all the time. You read my book. I have endless examples of people fudging the data. What happens? Nothing. They forget about it. Forget about it. Uh, why? Sports is more important. Texas, a couple of years ago, put in one of these things. You needed a C average in high school to play. Now, if you were a football player and you got a below a C average, you know when they impose when they impose the the uh, penalty. When's that? In spring. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, well, college football, they, you know, they let you play the ball game most of the time. Yeah, it's just when you next season. I had a lot of these athletes, and you know, what happens is, you know, if you punish the athletes to take them off the team, everybody's yeah. outraged. It's totally different. But, but a point I was going to make about school versus sports is that in sports, we're looking for the best possible players to get the best possible team, whereas in school, the public mission is to try to, to some degree, educate everyone. Right. Uh, uh, because there's a public good concept in education. So... Coming back to your book, Bad Students, Not Bad Schools, uh, how do you juxtapose that the environmental factor against the intrinsic factor? Uh, I, mean, I mean, for example, and here's, here's the context in which I'm asking that. In, the, in a recent review of your, of your latest book on the FamilySecurityMatters.org website, uh, it says here that your book offers a deeper analysis of what goes on in the world of education and that they've become huge jobs programs for countless administrators. So there's that problem of, of bureaucracy. But it also says that you're, you're an equal opportunity critic and you're just as hard on the nostrums of conservatives, such as school choice, charters, and vouchers, and accountability, holding the teachers accountable for the children that fail to learn. So essentially, uh, you're, it sounds like you're a critic of the voucher system. Uh, in other words, it's the intrinsic students that are bad, not the necessarily the school or the teachers. Therefore, sending the bad, the bad kids to a better school isn't going to make the student better. Is, would I be correct in assuming that that's your premise? Yeah. Word choice does might not make a person more motivated. Let me put it again going back to sports. Everybody understands that. Uh, I've been thinking about joining a gym here in New York City. You know what? Ha doubling the number of gyms in, in Manhattan where I live, what do you think the impact of that is going to be on my desire to go work out? So let's suppose there are five gyms in my neighborhood. And suddenly right. I announce a chain is coming, opening five new ones. Now okay. I have ten. You think I'm going to go down because I have ten, or as, of, as opposed to the old days when I had five? Maybe no, not. no, not at all. In fact, the people who advocate choice somehow believe that uh, the marketplace is like TVs. They always give you the same misleading things. Well, look, you know, when I was a kid, we had an 11 inch Philco TV, black and white, it cost $700. Today you can go out and you can get this monster that fills your entire room for $500. Okay, it's a thousand times better. Why? Market competition. So kids who are stupid are going to become little Einsteins that we had market competition. It's totally misleading. The reason why conservatives love choice, it gives them something to say. When people ask them, well, you're so negative. What are you going to do? I right. know these people. So you got to come up with an alternative solution. So what would your solution be to the clearly Very failing, uh, many, in many cases, inner city public schools or just public Very schools easy. in general? Very what, easy. What I have the answer. answer. What's that? The answer is very simple. Okay. Most kids, especially young men at an early age, make horrible decisions about their life. They don't see the value of schooling. I didn't see the value of schooling. My mother forced me to go. Um, so here's what you do. You, you lower the uh, requirement of staying in school to about 15. Maybe whatever it is. We can argue about that, okay? At 15, you can leave. But every kid who leaves, regardless of why they leave, gets, let's say, for sake of argument, a $10,000 certificate good at any, any proprietary school in the United States that's government certified. Adjusted for inflation, usable over a lifetime, okay? So John leaves school at 15, he's happy, he goes out, and he spends the next five years delivering pizzas, okay? <laughs> then he works, you know, in a car wash for five more years, okay? Now he's 25 years old. His brain, which had unfortunately migrated to the wrong place, okay, is beginning to migrate to the correct, it's trying to go up and migrate to the correct place, right? We all know about that experience. Mm -hmm. And he wakes up one day and says, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in a menial job. But I have a certificate now. It's now worth $16,000 thanks to inflation. I can go online and I can find all kinds of places that will teach me really useful skills. You know, like uh, repair, computer repairman or sure. fixing BMWs. And he's much more mature. Israel has a very good way of solving this problem. They put people in the army first before they go to college. Right, right, right. And when you come out of the army, you're a little bit more mature. Sure. And a lot of the problems of education are not necessarily these kids are hopelessly inadequate. Mm -hmm. They just lack the reality that comes with living in the real world. Once you live in the real world, have menial, I had lots of menial jobs, lots of them. Mm -hmm. And you learn. I found class was much more interesting.
All right. Very good. Uh, well, Dr. Weisberg, that's all the time we have. I want to thank you again for joining us today. This has been Inside Academia with yours truly, Andy Nash. Uh, check us out on the web on InsideAcademia.tv and check us out again next week as every week as we take you for a look behind the Ivory Curtain.